the planet Earth. A planet on which we tend to take energy-reliant factors such as warmth, comfort, entertainment and our material possessions for granted. One of the windiest parts of the British Isles, Orkney, an island off the north coast of Scotland. The Wind Energy Group, as main contractor for the United Kingdom Department of Energy, selected this site to build an MS1 250 kilowatt wind turbine generator with a blade diameter of 20 meters. It was the effectiveness of this first practical demonstration which validated the engineering design codes, paving the way forward not just to more machines, but to bigger and better ones. A parallel program in southwest England culminated in 1984 with the building of MS2, a medium-sized commercial prototype machine. The success of this prototype led to the installation in 1986 of a 20-turbine wind farm at Altamont Pass in California. The future quest for cheaper energy has led to the MS3. The rotor diameter is increased from 25 meters to 33 meters, enabling the energy capture to be increased by 50%. Results show the MS3 to be an even more cost-effective wind turbine. Now available from the Wind Energy Group. Back in the 19... 78-79 period, I um, persuaded British Aerospace, GEC and Telewidra to become equal shareholders of what was then called Wind Energy Group. The, the company started off by doing a variety of things, the first one of which was a design contract from the then Department of Energy um, who, uh, who wanted, to, uh, wanted us to design the largest turbine that we thought was technically possible. And that turned out to be a 60 meter diameter, 3 megawatt rated turbine, which we eventually called LS1. The LS1 machine was uh, rated suitable for a very windy site, an extremely windy site, 10 meters a second, which are the kinds of sites that people are only just beginning to talk about offshore. It's a very high wind site. It was an innovative machine of its time. It was an enormous thing with a 60, 60 meter diameter rotor and made it essentially out of a steel box with an elevator which take five or six men up the elevator. So this was a, a huge piece of engineering. The most um, striking memory I have, uh, which is when we first ran the turbine at three megawatt, um, as opposed to modern practice when it's, uh, people are not encouraged to be in the, in the rotors or in the nacelles of turbines when they're operating, our nacelle was actually large enough to, uh, to put a billiard table in. And looking out of the, uh, uh, the portholes on our nacelle, there was the uh, rain transversing horizontally past the windows and the machine was uh, working at full power. It was better than riding an elephant. The MS-1 was sort of slotted in. Um, I think it must have been slotted in at a later stage, saying we'd better check it out at a smaller scale before we build this big one. So we had a lot of fun, uh, although not perhaps the prettiest turbine, we had a lot of fun developing that and it had lots of things in it to, which, was, uh, which were experimental. So it had, you could run it uh, at uh, variable speed or at fixed speed, you could run it uh, with uh, pitch control. We had a, we had a, uh, a damper on the uh, drivetrain you could take in and out. So there were all sorts of things to do and then it was plastered with sensors. So my partner, Later, my partner, Ansel Hassan, was responsible for making the measurements on that turbine with load. I, we, I think we had a, several hundred sensors on there. So we, in later days, we used to call it the University of WEG because it was very much aimed at understanding the science and somewhat divorced from the commercial reality, I think. For us, in Taylor Woodrow, the wind energy work was very glamorous. And uh, it was fascinating because it was all new stuff for everybody. The entire English Welsh power system was run by a monopoly, the CGB. In their mindset, the, the notion of building lots of 100 kilowatt turbines, such as were being built in Denmark at the time, was rather silly. You know, it just didn't look right. It was a very um, top-down approach to build a, a large 3 megawatt machine as your first turbine. Um, while the Danes were building small turbines in their back garden sheds and putting them up and having them fall down and repairing them uh, a very much a bottom-up approach. They were learning how not to do things because if it didn't work it fell over and they 
fell over on a Sunday and they fixed it on a Monday kind of thing. Um, w with us, the machine, the early machines could not go wrong. We couldn't afford them to go wrong. And so they were fairly substantially over-engineered. So what we did was we said this approach is not going to work for wind turbines. What we need to do is form a small core group of engineers and develop and innovate in a way that will enable us to keep very cost effective. So one of our best machines was the, the MS2 that we built in uh, Altamont Pass in 1986. And in fact those machines are still there in 2009, apparently working 23 years later. The, the way wind farm was an amazing success given that only one or two machines were built as prototypes. We had a very innovative method of pitch control using a mechanical bull screw such that the, one, such the machine was completely fail safe. If anything went wrong, the grid cut and the machine wound off its own pitch and stopped on its own. There were no hydraulics, it was just good mechanical engineering. To improve cost effectiveness still further, the MS3 wind turbine generator was developed with an increased rotor diameter of 33 meters and a 300 kilowatt rating. Prototypes were built in 1988 at Carmarthen Bay in South Wales and at Altamont Pass. One of the critical things, so following this exciting period of building this wind farm in California, the MS2 machines, uh, we'd also embarked fairly rapidly on the on the designing the next machine, which we call MS3, which only had two blades, teetered hubs, so it's pretty sophisticated by the standards of the day, a pretty elegant and sophisticated piece of engineering to have a, a two two bladed teetered hub. Not many people had done that before, other than experimentally with prototype turbines. The well, the MS3 was really a development of the MS2 because although the MS2 was very successful we couldn't get it down to the price that the Danes who were producing... We, we had produced turbines in tens and they had produced them in hundreds or thousands and we just couldn't see how to get our technology down to their level of cost. Our innovative way to do that was to stretch the rotor to two blades with the same frame and capture 50% more energy. There was a gain in cost effectiveness. And we did that by having a two-bladed teetered rotor that then really became the, the, the backbone of the WEG technology. And it was the MS3 that then got put into all the UK wind farms in the early 90s. Uh, I was a fresh engineer uh, working under a very experienced engineer called Jeff Henderson, who's, who's now out in New Zealand carrying on the MS3 uh, in, in its torque limiting form, uh, and uh, you know, broke my teeth on, on, on trying to get to grips with a teeter mechanism and a centrifugal wedge that would turn on and off the teeter mechanism as it shut down and started up, and spending lots of time on the shop floor trying to understand why these wedges sometimes would work and wouldn't work as the friction changed. Uh, and now when I look back at that 20 years ago, I think, God, we must have been mad even trying such a thing. But we put them on the prototypes. Rob, what's it like? I'd left Taylor Woodrow and WEG and became the chief, chief executive of National Wind Power. And the part of that deal was that we'd, we'd build three wind farms, the first three wind farms in the UK, uh, with NUFO contracts.